Good afternoon. It's been about 50 plus years since I started studying and writing, reading military history. And about most of that time, I've also been involved in war games, or as we like to uh, euphemistically call them, conflict simulations. I've been reviewing and editing paper war magazines, things like that for about that period of time. And one of the things I've noticed mostly about war game designers is they fall into two categories. One is put everything in the kitchen sink into the design. Uh, I think culminating, for example, in, in uh, the campaign for North Africa that had the infamous spaghetti rule for Italians. Uh, that where they actually had to have some wood in order to boil the water for their spaghetti, which probably went a little bit further. Uh, and to designers who want to make certain that you get engaged in whatever they're trying to, uh, to simulate. Now, some of that engagement can be part of a battle or an operation or something like that was fairly balanced already. But there were also ones that, like the uh, market garden um, bulge, where you knew that the outcome was not going to be what the, the the planners just thought it would be, but it was close enough and would engage you in whatever you were trying to do. And then there are designs or operations where you just take a look at it and go, no way. Uh, for example, Kursk. You cannot literally, I think you may, may find one or two people who will actually try and design a game on Kursk, but generally ends up failing miserably because it's basically just a slug trying to put, push your head through a uh, brick wall. Um, about a year and a half ago, a friend of mine told me he was going to design a game on the Philippine Sea. And after all these years, I could just simply look at him with almost an open mouth and say, how in the world are you gonna make a game, a, a challenging, fun, engrossing game on the great Marianas Turkey ship? Surprisingly, he did a very good job. And what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the battle. Uh, I'll show you what my there is, and then talk about how he did it in the game, so that uh, you can see that there are sometimes you can take an absolute disaster and turn it into something that actually makes you think. So let's talk about. Uh, we'll look at the strategic situation very clearly because I think all of you will probably know what that is. Then we'll look at the battle and then we'll look at the game as well. Strategic situation at the time where Japanese had been pushed back to their uh, defensive line. You had Nimitz pushing into the, the center Pacific. You had MacArthur coming up New Guinea. The uh, Japanese at the time had absolutely no idea what was coming next. But what they ended up doing was basically putting their people close to their, their their oil um, pipeline or their, their oil source in hope that they could find out which where, where the Americans were coming and create what they hoped would be the decisive battle. Now, their definition of decisive battle was the Americans get stomped so badly that they negotiate. All right, that was their definition of what they were looking for. They, they'd basically been looking for that the entire war. That's what they were hoping to start with. And as we've already learned uh, by a couple of our uh, discussions today, pretty much that's what the U.S. was looking for as well. You know, if they, if they could get to that decisive battle, they'd end up basically putting themselves in the position of, of winning, you know, winning the war. All right, so Battles of the Philippine Sea, and I apologize, I missed that S. It's the Philippine Sea, not Philippines. 
was bought 19th and 20th on June. Previous carrier battle was at Santa Cruz. Six carriers were involved. 20 months later, they had 24 carriers involved at the Philippines. 190 camp combat vessels, third largest naval battle ever. If you include what the, the ships that were off Saipan at the time, it became the largest battle in the world. So that's what we're looking for. Imperial Japanese Navy, what were they trying to do? Decisive battle. They wanted to stomp us, let it, you know, get us to the uh, get us to the table. Azawa had basically nine carriers, five, five larger carriers, four smaller carriers, and the support forces. The tactics they were going to use, basically, he was going to fly his 450 carrier aircraft off, hit the United States, fly off to the island bases, resurface, rearm, fly him back to the carriers, hitting us on the way back, shuttle on it. The situation he had was he, because he had 600, at least he thought he had 600 some odd carrier or land-based aircraft to be able to help him in this particular battle. So he, he thought he would be fighting this particular decisive battle with about a thousand aircraft. The United States had a thousand aircraft in all of these carriers right here. There were three, basically 15 carriers in Task Force 58. Sim I'm sorry, Spruance's orders protect the Saipan landing force. That was his primary focus in this battle. His tactics basically were, let them come, we'll stomp on them. And that's basically what they ended up doing. Pros and cons on both sides. Japanese, their, car their aircraft had longer range, so they could, if they could find us, they could hit us before we could hit them back. And he knew exactly where we were because we were pinned to Saipan. On the, con on the other side, is their aircraft similar to what they started the war with, were very, very lightly armored. That's why one of the reasons they had, they had the longer range. The problem they really had was minimal training. The beginning of the war, their uh, naval, air, naval aviators had years of experience in training. By the time we got to 1944, it was measured in weeks. And that really made a difference. For the United States, we had a ton of good stuff. The uh, F6F Hellcat was specifically designed to, to beat the zero at that time. We had new radar that could see out a lot further. The uh, aircraft, we could see them coming and we could intercept them far beyond rather than try to fight them off once they were above our ships. Better anti-aircraft. We had the uh, the type of uh, anti-aircraft shells that had proximity fuses, knocked them right out of the sky. The con was basically they had the longer range, so as far as Bruins gave them, they had the initiative. We had to wait to see what they were going to do. The key deciding factor in this whole battle was the fact that the United States had already taken out the land-based aircraft. The real problem in that particular state is that Ozawa did not know that. They didn't tell the, uh, the, the land-based air, air commanders did not tell him that that was gonna be a problem. So he went into this battle basically expecting one thing and had half of basically more than half of his aircraft capability gone already. So the battle, basically Azawa attacked first. Spruance let him do it. They had basically four strikes came in. 
lost most of their aircraft at that time. The battleship South Dakota was hit by a single bomb. They had light damage to the uh, Wasp and the Bunker Hill, nothing else. What the uh, returning pilots for the Japanese told Azawa was, they had sunk four to five carriers. So he thought he was in, still in pretty good shape. But the problem he was running into was he was finding out that the land-based aircraft he was expecting were not there. Next day, the United States attacked in one wave, 216 aircraft, 20 were lost in combat, 80 were lost on the way back because we had to launch at such a long range out that by the time the planes came back, they were low on fuel and it was nighttime. So most of our losses during this battle came from basically planes just running out of fuel and ditching in the, ditching in the sea. Basically, and the U.S. Navy, air, uh, the aircraft, sank one Japanese carrier, damaged two more. U.S. subs sank two carriers. So basically, from nine carriers, at this battle, the Japanese lost three. So was that a victory or not? Japanese, it certainly was a defeat. Even though he thought he had sunk a lot of carriers, he didn't have any planes left. And the uh, US hadn't called him up and said, okay, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna talk to you now. You know, we're, we're done, you, you, you hurt us too bad. That didn't happen. So what they were looking for didn't happen. That was a definite defeat to the Japanese. To the United States, it was a success from the standpoint that the Japanese did not get to the Saipan landing areas. And that was exactly what Spruance needed to have happen. That was his primary goal. But every single one of his carrier commanders was pissed because they wanted to go after the carriers. They wanted to go after the Japanese Navy. They, and he's been basically after the war, after the, and almost immediately after the battle, all the carrier guys were complaining bitterly about his decision to stay on the defensive, let the Japanese have the initiative and not, per, not pursue as, as diligently as the heat they wanted to. So was he right or was he wrong? One of the things they came up with is the fact that they still had six carriers out there. That's what he knew. And that was, you know, right after the battle, he may not have even known about the two carriers that the subs had sunk. You know, at least one basically sank far later than uh, the, the uh, torpedo hit that actually ended up sinking, sinking it. He had no idea that their aircraft carrier carrier aircraft were gone, basically virtually gone. Bazawa left at 450 to start with. He ended up with a little more than 30 left on his carriers. He had no idea about that. And that was one of the reasons why the Japanese were able to take those carriers, those empty carriers, and act as a decoy source months later at Leyte Hall. So he didn't know that. And the carrier commanders didn't know that either. So that was why, why basically it was a, a success, but because at that particular time, the, the decisive nature of this particular battle was not known to the US. So that's the battle. That's what happened, that's the situation. So let's take a look at the game. This is, the game is called Carrier Battle, Philippine Sea. It's coming out from Compass Games. It is a solitaire tactical carrier battle. As a player is the US commander, not only the US commander, you are, you are Spruance, 
which are also the deck managers of all the carriers. The goal of the game is to put the player in the same position that Spruance was in. Know that the Japanese are coming, you don't know how, you don't know when. This is not, you know, the, the one thing that our designer who I'll introduce in a second did that makes this, I think, puts it into the challenging aspect is this is not a straight simulation. Straight simulation basically said, here are the carriers, here's the US carriers, let's throw some aircraft at each other and see what happens. It's not quite the same thing. What he has created is what he calls a plausible narrative. This is a situation where you have the Japanese and their entire order of battle, you have the US order of battle. That's basically all you know at that particular point. Designer is John Southard. Um, if you play war games at all, you probably recognize some of the, the, uh, his name. His most famous designs, at least the ones I like, and that's what really counts, right? Are the uh, Tokyo Express and Carrier that he uh, put together, you know, multiple years ago. Um, he is a naval enthusiast. Uh, he knows what he's doing. And one of the things that I brought, got out of the Philippine Sea design is the difference between where the U.S. was in 1942 and where we were in 1944. So that, that if you've played both games, it's, it's an interesting juxtaposition to see how far we've gone. And that's the one thing the Japanese did not know prior to Philippine Sea. They assumed that this carrier battle was going to be similar to the carrier battles off, off of the Solomons. They had, they had no real understanding of the advances that the US was getting ready to throw at them. So the Japanese system, basically you start with unknown forces. You have the, the Marianas here, you have the task force somewhere in this area here, Unknown forces can end up showing up anywhere in this half circle around those islands. The uh, forces show up randomly. Uh, you can call those basically, you're hearing things on, on the airwaves. Uh, somebody sees something, somebody hears something, et cetera, et cetera. But anywhere around here, Japanese forces can possibly, possibly show up. Each, each force during the turn will actually move either toward the point, point here or toward this area over here. And if you get, if the Japanese get into this area over here, basically that means they're attacking the landing force. So, and uh, basically that's something that the US player does not want to have happen. You have an intelligence ladder for the the Japanese forces. Initially, all you know is there may be something out there. You have to go searching for it. So one of the one of the key design points is the US player has to send out search planes to try and figure out what the heck is out there. If you find something, you've got a 50-50 chance of being in nothing. And if it, you know, basically a little bit less than that that you might find a carrier or, or a surface force. And that's literally all you know. They, there may be carriers there, there may be just surface forces there. Once you get there, once you end up searching a little bit further or having a more successful search, in other words, you've gotten past caps, et cetera, et cetera, you might find out a little bit more information. Uh, the force may end up having three or four carriers. What kind you have no idea, but you know it's a carrier force. Now, one of the things that John did in this particular design was he gave each carrier force, once you get to that point, a commitment level. The commitment level, basically you add that up 
And once you get to a certain commitment level, that basically means you have pretty much found all the carriers that the Japanese had thrown into this particular battle. At that point, a lot of the other unknown forces simply go away. You have found what the, what the Japanese are throwing at you. So it's a really, really nice way of making certain that basically you just, there, there is a limit to what you're gonna have to find. Once you've actually done a little bit more, you can find out a little bit more information, you know, a little bit more detail about what you're looking for. And when you actually finally attack the group, is that's when you're gonna find out exactly what you're up against. Is it uh, light carriers, which, or is it they're the big guys? The other way that they end up showing up there is that these unknown forces can actually throw an air attack at you. And at that point, you will know that that, that particular force is a carrier force, but literally you're, you're back up at level two, possibly level three of what, you, uh, what you've just found because they've thrown something. They have thrown something at you. All right, let's see what else we got. Okay, this is your job as the as the commander. You have command of all of the different task forces. Each one, there are basically five task forces, all in, all in Task Force Fifty Eight. You have the, the battle line, and you have four carrier forces. Each carrier force basically has four carriers. There's one that has only three, but you can, you know, that you have an option of adding an extra carrier there if you want. Your idea basically is you have charge of the movements. You also have charge of your air operations, air operations searches, sending out intercept groups, search, sending out raids, whatever you can, whatever you have to do. You have deck management. You can only, if you've got planes on deck to take off, you can't land. Once a, a plane app comes aboard the plane, you've got to get it off the deck, get it down into servicing or put it down into the hangars. So there is a period of time where your car carrier basically is going to be busy doing other things other than sending off aircraft. One of the big things here is fuel management. Once you put aircraft in the air, you're tracking their fuel. They'll use fuel every single turn they're in the air. If they get in, into uh, combat, they use a lot more. Surprise, surprise. And once you get down to the certain point where you get your uh, at, at low, low fuel, you start trying to land those aircraft and you could end up with problems. You know, low you know, low fuel aircraft have to get on that deck or or ditch. And sometimes if they're so desperate, you're gonna have a problem on that deck with a, a deck accident. You've seen, you know, if you've watched any of the uh, films from that period of time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Plane comes in, hits something, suddenly you have a deck that's no longer usable. And those planes are, you know, still in the air, gonna to have to find someplace else to go. So air raid type, for example, here, um, we'll just run through a quick example. Japanese air comes as just basically air points. Part of it will be your, your escort, part of it will be your attack planes. Each one of these represent approximately about 12 aircraft. So this particular raid with 24, Escorts and what do we got? 60 air <clears throat> attack craft are going to come up against the combat air patrol for the US. Or in this case, if, if radar has spotted this out further away from the uh, from your aircraft carriers, you can send an intercept group out of, of planes. And that's exactly what happened on raid number one of the Japanese. They were spotted early and they vectored a lot of Hellcats out to hit them first before they actually got them. But basically each one of your Hellcats here represents about 16 aircraft at this point. 
So basically, you you have a combination where you have to you have to put planes up against the escorts in order to try and get your rest of your planes in through the uh, attack group. Once they get once they've gotten past cap, there's a possibility at this point because they the Japanese planes are are pilots are not trained well enough. There's a possibility that they will fly over the battle line, which allows battleships and cruisers to fire at them with their anti-aircraft. And there's an also possible chance that they're not, they're just going to stop right there and attack the battle line. And in this case, that's exactly what that first wave from the Japanese did. They didn't get to the carriers. They, they attacked the battleships. And that was the wrong thing to do. That was not their point. That was not their priority. Their priority at this point was to take out the Japanese or the American carriers. And they were so poorly trained that they just took the first, first target they could find. Once you've figured out, you know, you've gone through the attack task force, the task force has its own aircraft, any aircraft remaining, the remaining aircraft will attack a random carrier. They were not trained enough to know we got to go for the big guys. If I see a carrier that has a, a flat stop, I'm going to hit it. That's basically what they were thinking at the time. If they got past all the anti-aircraft and all of the cap and everything like that. Possibility, then there's a possibility you can score some damage against those U.S. carriers. And if the carrier has planes on the deck, Damages even further. And you put a bomb a bunch of prepared air, aircraft, well, the damage becomes significantly more. Victory is basically determined by points. You get points for sunk, you know, if you, you sink your, uh, your camera, your carriers, you lose them if you lose your carriers. If the Japanese can get people off that, that section around the island, you'll lose a lot more points because that basically put, turns them loose in on, the, uh, on the, the landing force. Now, the one thing this does not take into account is the fact that there was a fairly substantial escort still off the coast of Saipan that would have fought whatever Japanese got, got through to them. So that basically is, you know, part of a battle that we don't we don't look at. Your job, again, as Spruance, is to stop that from happening. Okay, that, that's your that's your entire point. Victory levels basically, do you have a midway level? I mean, just the absolute level you're going to be in Washington D.C. in a ticker tape parade or whatever like that, or are you going to be humiliated and sent to Iowa? And, uh, Hopefully, some of you will recognize that particular literary uh, reference to uh, Stuber Forks. There are options in the game. You can start with fewer um, U.S. forces. Uh, Task Force 58.1 had been sent to Iwo Jima to knock out their, their aircraft there. They might not have made it back in time. The timing was a little different there. You can deploy them differently. Uh, again, the uh, US carrier commanders really wanted to move forward, you know, get closer to those Japanese so that they could hit them as almost before the Japanese could hit them. Now, the idea with that one is that now you have separated forces. Does that make you vulnerable? Or does it give you a chance to get that the much better victory than you really want. And finally, John has added what he calls the great carrier battle. This assumes that Midway did not happen. This assumes that the, the carriers that were lost at Midway are still available, not only still available, but still has their highly trained naval aviators on board. In this case, the Japanese can cause more damage. They can choose who they're gonna, going to hit, which basically means they're going to go for the big guys all the way through. 
So you have some options here that will allow you to kind of take a look at what might have happened if Spruance had been a little less defensive, if Michener had had his way a little bit more in, in you know, providing what the U.S., how the U.S. was going to fight this battle. So basically, that is the game. Now, I have played virtually all of these. This one, I'm going to be in Stuber Falls, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> anyway, that is the battle and the game. Um, be open to any questions you have. Would you mind expanding upon what you said about um, you, you just alluded to having a uh, seemingly negative outcome in one of the games uh, being sent out to Stuber Falls? If you wouldn't mind going into details of what actually happened in that scenario, just because we're curious. What happened in that was that uh, <clears throat> I moved two carrier uh, task force ahead of the other ones and had four carrier groups of the Japanese stomp on me <laughs> without the capability of the other two carrier forces providing me the aircraft because they had they had rain basically raids coming in on them. So their cap, their interception groups were all involved and suddenly I had way too many Japanese carriers or Japanese aircraft coming in. And I basically I, I got overwhelmed. And that was one of the things that was possible. That was one of the reasons that uh, the Spruance did not want to basically um, separate his, his group. Spruance had the idea, you know, up to that point, the Japanese approach to an operation was multiple forces coming from various different directions. In this particular battle, Azawa didn't do that. He combined everybody and went straight for the center. But Spruance would not have known that. So he had to cover that entire range until he knew exactly where the, where the Japanese were. And that's one of the, the fun parts about this particular game is you really don't know. You know, until, until you have found all those carrier forces and basically every single one of those unknown forces, you have to assume as a carrier force until you know specifically that it's not, which means you either have to look at it or it has to do something or you found everybody else. So is that okay? Sir. Um, back to your point about Bruins not knowing how many losses the Japanese had suffered, was there not some sort of integrated air intelligence reporting system? You know, where the pilots would be briefed that they came back and so forth. He knew that his his um, pilots had had a great day. I mean, you know, you've got you know landing and he's going like this. For example, so he knew he had scored very, very heavily. Problem with aircraft is they're replaceable. Um, the comments we've had earlier today, one of the one of the ideas that you have in wargaming is you, you lose carriers and you lose pilots, or you lose. I'm sorry, you lose aircraft and you lose pilots. A lot of them. So he knew they had had a good day. But that didn't necessarily mean they had had the best day. He had no clue what was what the Japanese had left, essentially, and that was again one of the reasons they were able to to uh, to be the decoys at Lady Gulf. Uh, so, speaking of the alternate scenarios, did you have a scenario plan? Did you have a scenario plan, uh, or is there already one? For uh, if the Americans had not done the preparatory raid to destroy the land based aircraft, if Ozawa had the full thousand aircraft to break the ban. Yes, there, are, there is an option that allows more land based aircraft for the Japanese. Sure. Uh, the big question is where do we get I see you. Beg pardon? Where do we get this game? It's uh, being, it actually has just been put out by Compass Games. Uh, you can find that online pretty much. Uh, compassgames.com, I think, is their uh, is their website. So. John, in your research, have you ever had a chance to check base with Anthony Tully? Anthony Tully, 
he, he co-authored uh, Shattered Sword of Midway. I recognize him. told me that he was writing the book on Hilton C. But I don't know where he is on that book. No, basically what I did was um, I just worked with John. I've, I had, uh, I've known John for probably 60% of my 50 plus years in, in the, the city. We've worked together before. Um, I don't know if any of you are, are familiar with the uh, infamous Counterattack magazine. Uh, John was the game um, editor for counterattack, I was the the word editor. Uh, that's where we got uh, we knew each other and worked on things together. So, sir, um, it's an interesting question that comes up about intelligence because I think that uh, earlier in 1944, um, the United States got possession of the show plan, but I'm not sure that Scrooge saw that because. That was the seventh fleet operation. Do you have any sense of whether Spruance was aware of what we've gotten? I had not read anything or seen anything that indicated that he did. Um, I knew that there were a lot of, there was a lot about this particular battle that that uh, is still, you know, large in question. I know um, in the Osprey book, um, Mark Stiles indicated that he thought that Spruance knew about um, show, and he knew that the uh, carrier pilots were not well trained and should have been more aggressive because of that. So it's, um, I haven't run into anything like that. Um, maybe Mr. Tully has at that point. So I'm not certain I, I know how to answer your question. Well, the same question comes up with one of the Yes. Yeah, it does. And it's, again, a lot of it happens, you know, it's, as, what was it, the, uh, the, the, the joke that, uh, you know, crap happens, or, yes. or as the Mormons would say, shoot happens. Um, a lot of that comes into, um, a lot of that comes into play, which, what you think you know may not be what you really know. So I, I at this point, I'm not really certain. You know, a good example would be, uh, did Spruance at, on the 20th of June know that two carriers had been sunk by the subs? Well, why is it pretty spectacular so one, yeah, that. one was because he put four four fish into it, and I think he stood there and watched it sink. I mean, that was the sub commander. But the other one, basically on the what the Tahoe, yeah. that, how to pronounce that, um, took one fish. Right, and, and then uh, and then well, later on, it was it was the damage control that lost it. Now I don't I don't think the uh, sub commander stuck around for that. Well, but now you got to do that more fun because we're reading their their mail and did someone report it. Exactly. You know, and if you know, did the uh, did the sub command there in uh, Australia let him know? You know, I, I'd assume after the fact that they they would know that. But you know, at the time, you know, particularly when his his carrier commanders are are grumbling, you know, under their breath out. Well, the, the other question is what what's limit, what uh, orders Phillips actually had, because I think the orders may have included the primary targets of Japanese fleet. His prime, you know, the first the the first order he got was was to go and you know to hit the Japanese fleet. Second order he got was to make certain that the landing force was secure, and he decided that's. Where what that's what he was going to go. <clears throat> got to my <laughs> oh. so, really quick, John. Just can you just describe how you got involved in developing more? Just really quick. Ah, uh, well, when I decided to become a professional writer, uh, any of you know that it's writing for yourself is one thing. 
writing for somebody else is an entirely different approach. So I got it basically got into wargaming because I was been writing for myself and I decided to go you know, write professionally. But I needed something else on the side to kind of, you know, while I was drudging through learning how exactly how to edit my own writing, I wanted something to kind of kind of refresh my brain a little bit. So I got into wargaming at that point, and then basically writing war game reviews, helping with designs, things like that became, you know, a hobby. One last question. Just one thing to sort of carry on is somebody who's interested but has a very novice level of how these things are done. I'm curious when it comes to factors like pilot experience for Japanese, individual pilot skills are going to be very different and they're inherently sort of non quantitative when it comes to coming up with the system. How in like a war game do you actually take account for like individual skills or assessing maps in a system of like dice rolls and these sorts of things? Again, that, that depends on the level of the game. Uh, you play, you know, like a plane to plane. Uh, generally, those kind of aircraft versus aircraft, you will have uh, pilot experience uh, that you can gain if you, you play the game more than once, or you play it against other people. You'll, you know, every victory gives you a certain number of points. You get to the point you become a more experienced, quote unquote, pilot. Um, in a game like this, basically, it's more the designer's assessment of the overall operations, you know, what happened. For example, in the difference between the Philippine Sea and the Great Carrier Battle, John basically increased the ability for the Japanese to, to score points or basically score hits. He also gave them the opportunity to choose a target. Now, both of those give you a, a sense for a higher level of, of pilot training. Whereas the other ones is basically, oh, there's there's a ship, it's not mine, I'm gonna hit it. Type of 